Hi. Hi. So uh, all CrossFitters, right? Anyone not? That makes this easy. So I'm back. No. <laughs> I never really went away. Um, I, uh, I've been doing for the past two years in earnest what I've done for the past decade. And that is study how it is that a guy like me could have people like Zoe Harcomb and Thomas Seafried and Malcolm Kendrick and Gary Fetke and Tim Noakes and David Diamond and Tim Roche and all these scientists, Peter Gauthier. I'm leaving people out, but we had into Santa Cruz in my home at the MDL ones at our derelict doctor club, um, scientists, researchers, physicians uh, from around the world, each of whom had some vital message, vital in the sense of essential, like, like necessary for the optimal uh, uh, functioning of the organism, people with an essential message, and yet that message was diametric or orthogonal to the mainstream view. They had taken heat for it, been criticized. I mean, imagine what it's like to be a Zoe Halcombe or a Malcolm, Malcolm Kendrick and be told in The Guardian that your effect on the civilization has been like that of a war criminal. And this is long before COVID. And I, I knew it was significant and I knew that something was wrong in science. There wouldn't have been a CrossFit if there wouldn't have been something wrong in science. In fact, I've kind of come to see that I'm kind of a guy meant for, for fucked up things. Um, like, I don't know what I'd do if, if fitness were perfect and everyone ate right. I don't, I don't know what, I'd have to, I, I can't imagine what I'd do. Um, and I, I've, I've always enjoyed uh, uh, looking around in the midst of mass hysteria or delusion and trying to get a sense of things. And, and CrossFit was born out of that. And I've continued in that exact vein. And we've all known about broken science for quite a while. Can you hear me well enough? Show of hands in the back. And if none of you have explored broken science, I would suggest you do something as simple as put broken in science into Google or any other search engine, look what comes up. It's pretty fascinating that, how big an issue this is. And it manifests as the replication crisis, reproducibility crisis, replicability crisis. Um, a whole lot's been written on it, a whole lot has, has been discussed. And what I've done over the past two years is trying to, try to learn more about it so that maybe instead of just having these people over as all of us sharing this understanding that there's something tragically missing in the mainstream view, maybe there's some takeaways as to what that is. And I gotta tell you, I don't, I don't have an answer from any kind of societal perspective. Things are really, really bad. And I would show of hands if you've noticed, and I'm not gonna get into COVID or critical race theory. I'm not gonna talk about any of that stuff. I'd like to do this without being polarizing, uh, any more polarizing than I naturally am. Um, <laughs> But we don't have to get into the weeds on any of this. If I could just say, is by a show of hands, you notice that something has changed significantly and for the worse in the past five, 10 years, right? Big hands up high. Let's, no one's coming after you. Yeah, and for those of you that haven't seen that, no, what are you kidding? This is great, you know? Um, like, you know, the three-year-olds that are drawing stick figures with masks on them, like that's, that's the way it's always been. But if you haven't, if you don't have some inkling of a sense of something in it, it, that's gone awry, then tune me out and come back later. But for those of you that do, I'm, I'm talking specifically to you. And I think in a kind of a high order of view, I can, I can shed some light on some, some of this. Um, I have very little hope for uh, our society and our culture. And I wish I could come up, but that doesn't impress me. I'm not here, I'm not bummed out about it. I just, I'm just, I can just tell you, I can't find logical reason to be optimistic. I felt the same way about health though, and fitness. But what I did know is that while not having, and this came to me from a reporter that I've been hit over and over and over again, Greg, you have to admit, CrossFit is not for everyone. And one day it popped out of my mouth. It just came from nowhere because I'd been abused by that for so many times because it's, yeah, I get that, you know. But what I said was this one time, it just came out, you're right, but it's for anyone. And what is that anyone as opposed to that every man? Well, you got to be willing to show up. You got to be willing to discomfort yourself. You got to come back tomorrow. I mean, you got, you got it's, it's going to be you. There's no, I don't have any information. Oh, I learned that. Now I'm, now I'm healthy. It's not like that. You're going to have to do something. 
And but amongst those people who engage, participate, maybe even have to suspend belief for a while just to see how it comes, show up Monday, show up Wednesday, show up Friday, three weeks later, in many cases, you, you understand, now you know. And so that's what that any man is. And so on this science front, and uh, Emily Kaplan here has been, uh, Emily was uh, working for CrossFit uh, HQ in public relations. And as things got strange for me, she was a very, very capable defender of me and, and, uh, and, and oversaw almost single-handedly with a team of lawyers um, my departure and has stayed with me on this science front. And so she's my partner in studying broken science. And what we're doing is producing a curriculum of science studies, one that doesn't make uh, physicists laugh, uh, one that is, uh, is consistent with how science is practiced, where it replicates as opposed to where it can't. And uh, uh, the goal is this. I'm not going to fix messed up science, but I can do this. I can protect any man, any woman, anyone from the from the, the ravages, from the tyranny of shitty science and its scientists. Now, it's not, the, it's not a real easy thing to do, but it is a pretty simple thing to do, and we can just kind of start talking about that today to give you some sense of how it is that science went bad and what it means to be broken to not replicate. Any questions before we do it? Anything about that? Comments, observations, it'll help me if you give me some inputs. I get, in private, I get asked all the time how I'm doing. Let me tell you something, I've never been happier, okay? So in terms of me, um, this, is, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. Getting to work on this for sake of family, friends. I got kids, I take them to school. We, I just got back from Belize and we're gonna take a sailing trip through the Mediterranean. I'm building a house in Scottsdale, uh, remodeling another one on Coeur d'Alene. I mean, I couldn't, I'm doing exactly what I, I, I would do if I were in heaven and got to call the shots. So Greg's great, okay? Um, yeah, thank you. I've never, I've always been happy. I've never felt this good about anything. The stress is fundamentally gone. And I didn't know what stress I was under. I worried about all of you, everyone. I worried about every gym owner, every gym owner. And uh, I, I do so much less now. Um, let's talk about what science is and what it isn't. And I think more important than learning what it is, I think, is perhaps learning what it isn't. That might be easier and maybe more important. Anyone want to take any stabs at that? Don't hate to put people on the spot, but I've seen this done before. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing to just, especially with groups of big say, look, I bring my own markers. Science is, isn't any sense. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's source and repository of man's objective knowledge. So let's just start. That's great. I'm sorry? For sure. Lack of curiosity. Hard to imagine that consistent. And that's kind of on that sociological side, psychological side. Challengeable. Challengeable. You, you've never done asking questions. Never. Falsifiable, repeatable? You know, the falsifiable was a Karl Popper's demarcation. And I would hold falsifiable as a, as a, a I, I, I'm sensitive, I'm, no, I'm sympathetic to the argument that it's a requirement for a meaningful proposition, that it be falsifiable. Um, but as a demarcation as to what constitutes science or not, it's been an abysmal failure. And part of what I have come to learn is that academic science in relying on Popper, Kuhn, Fire Abbott, and Licatos, the guys that David Stove calls the irrationalists, there's a lot happening here. But one of the tragic turns that academic science made was using falsifiability as a demarcation to, mark, to demarcate science from non-science. I just feel like you depart from science when things become, when you can falsify, when you can't falsify. When you cannot falsify something, we, do, we move away from meaningful propositions. And science, and, but you know what? Aries acute is meaningful and could be falsified, but it's not a scientific assertion in that it lacks something else that we'll come to. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pooping on the falsification notion, but I'm telling you, it is a criteria for, for rationality, for meaningful um, discussion. And I do believe that Popper took that directly from the Vienna Circle um, and the logical positivists who he was trying to influence and desperately hoped that they would take him in their ranks, and they never did. But uh, that, 
that kind of is, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna running with it. I'm just gonna, these that are working with what I'm looking for, I'm gonna take objective right here. And then I'm gonna kind of push into the next piece here. Um, it's man's objective source of knowledge. It's both source, isn't that a brilliant red? That's Crayola crayons, uh, dry erase marker. After all these years, loyal to Expo, and they're just, it's gone, right? It's source and repository. So it's where we get our objective knowledge, and it's, and it's where it sits. And it sits siloed in models. And these models have four flavors depending on, and this gives away a lot, depending on their predictability, on their quality or ability to make predictions, graded on predictability. And that's conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. But this is, as, this is important, and this is the true demarcation, not falsification. And I'm talking about the classical demarcation of science from non-science. It, 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 the demarcation is predictability. And so we could sit here for a long time and talk about the difference between astronomy and astrology, but what turns out is that um, astronomy's contention or astrology's contention that Aries make for good girlfriends would find less predictive value than, say, an astronomer saying there's going to be an eclipse of the moon in 463 days, 5 hours, 9 minutes, and 12 seconds. And if you look to the history of man, our quest for for uh, uh, prediction is really amazing. The things we have done, I'll just toss some of these out at you. I had at one point wanted to memorize these because it would have been such a nice parlor trick and you'll probably see in a video at some point where I am able to do that. But uh, the uh, efforts that have been put into, memory, into uh, predicting the future include uh, electromancy, that's making birds take off and see which way they go, tell you everything you need to know. Astrology, astromancy, augury, bazi, bibliomancy, cartomancy, seromancy, chiromancy, chronomancy, clairvoyancy, claromancy, cold reading, consensus science. Hey, I had to, that's mine, I put that in there. Um, crystallomancy, expistacy, face reading, feng shui, gastromancy, geomancy, horispacy, horology, hor orari, astrology, hydromancy. I Chin, Kao Sim, Lithomancy, Modern Science, that's mine too, that's the one that actually predicts the future. Uh, Molybdomancy, Naivology, Necromancy, uh, Nephomancy, Numerology, Oniomorancy, Onomancy, Palmistry, Paroastrology, Paper Fortune Teller, Pendulum, uh, this one uh, the printer didn't catch. Rhabdomancy, rune casting, scientism, scrying, spirit board, that's your Ouija board and shit, right? And tasiography. And if you look up each of these, what you'll find is that these were guaranteed methods in different cultures and times, some of them thousand years old, that were believed proven ways to read the future, none of which were. And so we only have really one source of objective knowledge, and it, it, it is modern science. And it finds validation, how? Through predictive power. That's it, predictive power, which puts us squarely in the space of probability theory and induction. Kind of running ahead of myself here. But what happened in the 1930s with Karl Popper and his mistaken uh, 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 to, pick, to pick falsification versus over predictive value. Was an affliction of academic science. This isn't Elon's problem. What's happened is this is and this is the thesis that Emily have now, and I have now taken around the world. And what I've done is queried the best minds in, in philosophy of science. And of course, there are people that have come from the same tradition that I have, so it was pretty clear that I would be able to find their favor if I cast my, my story and thought right. But our thesis is this, is that when science replaced predictive value with consensus as the determinant of a scientific model's validity, science became nonsense. Largely what we did is we ended up with a corpus, a body of published research that won't replicate. 
You know, boy, if that's not broken, I don't know what broken is. And the areas where the, uh, uh, neat little, it's funny, I'm going to recommend a lot of Wikipedia articles to you, and I couldn't hate Wikipedia any more than, I, I know I hate it more than anybody. Everything important they've got wrong, but it is a reasonable place to start an introduction and have a discussion. I would recommend that if you're not familiar with the replication crisis, that you look there and look to see what fields, by their own admission, have a corpus of published science that will not replicate. It includes psychology, economics, sociology, uh, all of the outlandish stuff you might study at school for which your kid told you that's where they're going to spend the money. You'd be like, oh, wow, shit. Are you going to get a job? All of those. But tragically, sadly, it also impacts medicine. And one of the areas that has demonstrably been hit hardest for which there is a dramatic and very expensive multi-billion dollar effort to demonstrate the replication era is in oncology. And what happened is that a fellow named Glenn Begley at Amgen, director of research there, had been queuing up clinical trials for cancer drugs and one after another, after another, after another, they failed. We had Glenn Begley out to Santa Cruz for one of these DDCs. So this is someone that was part of our, part of our uh, uh, heritage and having him out from Australia to talk to us. And what they did was he decided that maybe the problem with these clinical trials, because he has a, has a long 30-year record of bringing drugs to clinical trials, and he knows about where your batting average should be. And here he's finding no matter what they do, it doesn't work. And so he began, began to doubt the preclinical science, the science on which these clinical trials were motivated in oncology and hematology. They identified 46 studies that were benchmark, landmark, and it turned out that 11 of them could, would replicate, and the others would not. Billion dollars in a decade to figure that out. We don't know to this date which ones replicated and which did not. One of them that did not replicate, Dr. Begley told us, and he did this in conjunction with a guy named Ellis at uh, UT Southwestern. Fascinating in the aftermath of this, Begley gets a standing ovation when he appears in audience and Ellis is escorted off and on campuses with security. But what we know is that, is that fundamentally oncology, I get any oncologists in here, they just hate this fucking lecture. Um, you may practice oncology as a craft and do so with the skills and the, and the manners and the behaviors and the epistemic values of a scientist, but the underlying uh, work is, is, is seriously flawed. It has a desperate, serious problem that doesn't seem to be getting better. One of the studies that wouldn't replicate has been, has been uh, cited 5,000 times since being discovered to be false. John Iannotis, who is the most... Uh, cited physician in all of medicine and by far, and the ninth most cited scientist in all of peer-reviewed literature, wrote a piece that is the most cited bit of medical research of all, and it's why most research findings are false. And so if I go back to this Popperian falsification versus predictive value, put a little piece of it up here, versus predictive power, What we find here is that this is in academia, and that the predictive power one is more like industry. You might, some of you already get a sense of things, that it might be easier to have a theory in psychology or sociology that is patently false, your pet theory, and it hasn't impacted your ability to teach at the university. Can you imagine a theory on rocketry that was fundamentally flawed and trying to work with Elon on getting something to Mars? Now, some would say he has a distinct advantage in that the, the, the field in which he's testing these things is, has got the advantages inherent, advantages of easier to do experimentation. That is without a doubt true. But the problem is, is that when validation comes from agreement, and really what I'm standing here telling you is that the argument from authority is bullshit. Do you know how long that's been known? But when someone gets in front of you and says, if you don't believe in me, you're not following science, or if you don't follow me, you don't believe in science, or anything that sounds anything like that, what we need to do is we need to train ourselves collectively where that inspires a laugh. 
because that is clearly coming from someone who does not understand what science is. Can you be a scientist and not know what science is? Oddly enough, you can. And I've thought of other examples of things you could be and not understand. It's actually, it actually can happen. It actually can happen. Um, this is deductivist. And this is inductivist. These people have the p-value fiasco. These do not. In fact, one of the fellows that we're drawn close to, that I know Aaron knows, um, has with a guy named Trafenow uh, uh, suggested an alternative to null hypothesis testing that involves predictive power. Someone was talking about, it was John Iannotti's, was talking about it would be neat to say, see the IHME algorithms that created their models. That maybe then we could better understand the math if we could see how these models were built. I have no interest in the models. I would, I would pay to not see how they were built. Why? because they have no scientific value or merits until they've predicted something successfully. Don't tell me about your race car when the fucking thing won't start, okay? If you can't make it go, I don't wanna, I don't wanna hear about the theory underlying the thing. Make it go 260 miles an hour, now I'm dying to hear. I wanna know what, how you did that, what's in that motor. We have been, we have been listening to people, feeding us all kinds of theories, and those are models, a theory is a model, it's just an if-then proposition, right? We've been fed a lot of models that have proven nothing, shown nothing, demonstrated no predictive value. That's just a part of what we want to address here. There's so much that can be talked about. It turns out that these two sides that the that the academic and the industrial, and we might as well just light it, call it that, is a generalization. There are other differences that are, that are fascinating about them in terms of uh, uh, won't replicate and must replicate. What other differences? Emily, what's from the list? It's a long one. Questions, anything on this? Is this interesting? Where you find the replication crisis and where we find scientific misconduct, it's associated with peer review. It's a problem in peer review. And what is peer review? Well, that's the process by which the NSCA said that CrossFitters, that you were injuring people. That was an amazing experience to firsthand see the peer review process from the e emails of the peer reviewers taken by court order from a forensic examination of their servers, but to actually see how a guy would say, I'm not gonna publish this if people aren't getting hurt, and he's like, oh, we don't have injuries, and it can't be published, and he's like, here, we got some injuries, yeah, there you go, that's the way to do it. You got peer reviewed to defame your efforts. And this was in the, this was the, this was the, 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 the highest level of academic uh, training. Ask a question. Please.
a wonderful stew of both, and it brings you here. There's a definition of corruption like a corrupted file in, a, in, a, in some code. So you, you lose a, a bit of some piece in a string of code and the file doesn't, it doesn't work now, right? It's been corrupted. And so it's something altered or missing that affects the, the performance of something, its function. There's that corruption. Then there's taking the money and running looking both ways, right? These go hand in hand, it's amazing. Think of how hard it is for, for uh, Think of how, 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 with what ease you can alter a consensus versus get an outcome of an experiment to predict something different. It's really easier to just pay someone to change their mind. And in fact, when a guy is about to publish a paper and it's been approved for peer review and I pay her to change her opinion on it and it gets peer, it gets peer reviewed, it's still, it's, it's, it's satisfying the consensus requirement. It's still it's new the consensus, you just bought a new one. And uh, uh, powers that be in pharma, in uh, food and beverage, have founded a child's play to purchase just about any science you want and get it published in peer-reviewed journals. So it's a, it's a wonderful stew of both. And my draw into this, I actually got in from the uh, uh, deliberate scientific misconduct aim and ahead of uh, coming to face with the fact that there are people, the people that get a, a wee pee and, and crow that they found cause, you know, small p value, and they think that must be, in fact, powerful evidence of a causal factor, and it is not at all, not in the least. Question? Can you explain the difference between an inductive versus a Bayesian framework? Yeah, um, you know, and I, I would, I've, I've gotten a pretty good effort to, to not use the, the Bayes term, but if asked if I'm a Bayesian by someone who's looking at me, I'm going to say, yes, I am. Um, I have some problems with subjective Bayesian and priors and all that kind of thing. But the, the people that, that have this figured out um, come from that side of things. What happened was that with falsification, um, what Popper was trying to do was put, put science on a deductive groundwork. He wanted the certainty of deductive logic and, and went off in that direction. The truth of the matter is, is that scientific assertions that models find validation from their predictive power, and that is a, that is a percent, it is probability, and it is the space of induction. And uh, uh, one leads directly to a lack of replication and no growth. And the other thing too is very few scientists, except for some theoretical physicists only briefly, took the whole falsification and deductivist thing seriously. But what happened when we went down this road is that the scientists from Laplace to Jeffries to Shannon, Cox, brilliant minds in physics and communications theory in physics, um, what, what happened was that the inductive uh, probability um, or probability theory that they developed, the logic of probability, um, got suppressed and ignored for a long time. And we live right now in an era where it has been unleashed. And these kids, the Bayesians, have come forward and with modern computing methods, uh, the case has been made very, very strongly. For those of you that have uh, tolerance for this kind of thing and interest, um, E.T. Jaynes uh, is a physicist who published in 2003 uh, probability theory the logic of science. And I tell you what, the number of scientists in genetics, in AI, in radar systems, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, all kinds of advanced computing fields that hold Jane's up as a hero is really interesting. You really get a who's who of the smartest scientists on earth by finding who it is. Jane's died in 98, his book was written in 2003. Just to give you a sense of the kind of impact he's had the gentleman that finished the book and put it together and published it in 2003, a guy named Larry Bredhorst, who we've had some, <laughs> these guys, it was some of the most challenging conversations you could ever have, is a physicist employed by uh, Washington University St. Louis Medical School Department of Radiology, and he has written code using methods that recognize the 
inductive uh, 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 probability of inductive logic or, or inductive probability. Um, he's written code that has passed a bunch of states' uh, radiology state boards. So, and these things can, this code can read MRIs, X-rays, and sonograms, a thousand of them in three seconds with cr uncanny accuracy. And so these guys are really making some progress using the very methods that in academic medicine, um, in ma sorry, academic science studies, we find aren't accepted. Let me tell you one real important difference here. Um, this side wants to talk about the probability of a hypothesis given the, uh, the data. And that's what it looks like. P, parentheses, H, straight line D. That's raised to the probability of the hypothesis versus the data. Um, these guys tell you that you need to only look at the probability of the data versus the hypothesis, and that is the only thing that makes sense and that this can never be done at all. Once you talk about the impossibility of a hypothesis out of improbability, you're no longer able to admit that a theory finds validation in its predictive value. And it's, it's, it's as wrong a turn as a turn could be made wrong. It's like getting up to I-40 and making a right instead of left and expecting to see Flagstaff and instead you're finding other cities. I mean, it is just that obvious a bad turn. What I find really compelling is that where science works beautifully, I'll use Elon again, where people are doing things, making discovery, advancing technology, driving science rapidly, there's very little interest or discussion in philosophy of science. Where science is moribund, stuck, won't replicate, and ridden with, with thieves and miscreants, there's an enormous focus on philosophy of science, and it's dead wrong. And so currently, there isn't a science studies that you don't find at a university. And it's all of this, and I'll put their names up here, because they were, they were dead wrong and had horrific negative influence. Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, and Feyerabend. Uh, these are what David Stove called the irrationalists, and if you have interest in this, I couldn't recommend David Stove enough, Australian philosopher who wrote five books, each with a very different, three are really the same book, two with an entirely different approach to looking at the, at the grounding of induction and the grounding of science. But he's written extensively on these four, and the academic uh, uh, science studies is entirely of that Popperian, Kuhn, Lakatos, Feyerabend variant. It wants to know about only about the probability of data given hypothesis. These are the frequentists. This is what gets you to p-values. This is what gets you to over certainty. These people don't mean the same thing as the others about random, about certainty, about chance, about probability. Fascinating thing to dig into the weeds and just look at what the meanings of probability are. This is a kind of a rough thing for people, and I probably didn't want to do this here today. But on this side of things, it's actually believed that the, that the come on up one through six and even number of the dice is that that is, that probability is a feature of the dice, that it's, that, that those numbers are somehow baked into the structure of that thing. Guys on, on the other side, my side, for us, probability reflects the limits of your understanding which makes it sound subjective, but it really isn't. It's pretty much a fascinating thing. I give you an example. I flip a coin, and I ask, what are the heads, what are the chances that it's heads? And you're gonna tell me? One, two. What's that? 50%. 50%, and that is exactly the right answer. Look at me. I'm gonna tell you, I, 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 I have a one, right? You believe that? I mean, you saw me look at it. What's the difference? It's my knowledge. It doesn't sit in the coin. Uncertainty is in our heads, not in the nature, not in the universe. This gets in some fascinating turf quickly, but it's very, very interesting just how prominent this divide is in thinking. Um, my side is a minority, for sure. Only in the sense that, and I'd say the, the, most PhDs employed in science are employed by industry. 
Um, but when we talk about the philosophy of science, it all sits in academia, okay? But uh, the, uh, the problem we have is that our kids, I think, I think it's a mistake to teach someone in the seventh grade about the solar system and get the balls out and spray paint them and put them on the coat hangers, right? And then we'll spend a week or two in the, uh, with the periodic chart and then we're gonna talk about photosynthesis and contrast that with respiration for, for developing ATP, the currency of all bioenergetics. And they kind of a survey thing where we've got this view that science is a bunch of trivial facts that we'd put in a bucket that may come up in trivial pursuits someday, right? And maybe you can accumulate enough of those facts to end up being a scientist. I think that's a, a grave mistake. I think what we need to do is first teach kids what science is and what it isn't. And so I want to get that answer that it's source and repository of man's objective knowledge. That it is, that it's, that this, this knowledge silos in models. These models have four levels of, 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 of graded appreciation based on their predictive value, et cetera. When I was a kid and I had great upbringing in this, we hear that nine out of 10 dentists recommended my dad to jump up when, before remote control, turn the TV down and tell me it's bullshit. There's no voting in science. And it doesn't matter one whit what nine out of 10 dentists believe. In fact, he wants to hear about the one dentist because it's the one dentist that's gonna have the revolution, the future, the advances. You're always listening to the one in 10, not the nine in 10. I grew up with that and it was very, very powerful. I think there's a way to codify that simply in some really elegant lessons and share that with the world. I plan on doing that. I'm in a neat position. I've got the time. I've got the friends. I've already run to the people that if they said this was bullshit, I would be like, well, fuck, I better look at this again. No, I've already gotten their approval and gotten the attaboys and the encouragement. I've got the resources, so I'm gonna do this. I can't be stopped, which I love things like that. <laughs> And I, and I enjoy sharing it with you because whether you know it or not, we've been here before on the health and fitness front. We stood up to a, to, to a consensus that was patently wrong, dead wrong. Old ladies shouldn't squat, holy cow, yes, they should squat. It's an emergency that they squat, right? We have this, you know, this margin of decrepitude and it's moving in or moving out or holding still, where are you? And we gotta push that, keep that at bay, right? This level one stuff. So I came here today to share with you, I'm super excited about broken science and I'm gonna be redoing these DDC-like things and bringing other people around. One of these people that I didn't plan on talking about today but was at lunch is Jay Bhattacharya, who fascinated me as a friend of Aaron Ginn's. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, written extensively on, he says, the greatest driver of inequality in the past 50 years has been the lockdowns. Think about that, think about me. You think I know the difference between sitting by my pool in Scottsdale during the lockdown? Let's get some Chinese food from Grubhub versus sitting in Camden, New Jersey in a tenement in the 14th floor with the windows boarded up with guards outside to make sure people don't leave the building. What this has done for people of color for disadvantaged, for the downtrodden is unthinkable, unthinkable. It resulted in race riots. Did anyone predict those race riots? Emily? I did. Long before the BLM saying that this ends in race riots. Where did I get that from? The CDC. They published a study. They said that this always ends in race riots, regardless of when, where, quarantine, mass quarantine disproportionately affects marginalized people and you get race riots. Sure enough. We're not gonna change the world, but we can change each other and we can change our friends, right? And boy, that feels a lot like the world changing. But I tell you right now, I see in the mainstream significant efforts to undo everything you've done. You think, the, you think the low fat thing's gone? The anti-meat thing, you think that's gone? It's not, it's not. Thanks for your ear. I didn't wanna turn this into, we could pay, prove Bayes' theorem. No, I'm, I'm having a blast. And uh, 
you guys were, were, uh, were my inspiration. I, uh, I got to, to put something forward in the world that you demonstrated the value of it, gave purpose to my life, it's made a lot of people healthier. And I think we're going to do the same thing again, just on a, on a kind of an up, upstream level. Questions? How are you? It's good to see you, sir. You know, I don't, I don't know who's ready for it, but if you were to look at, brought my recent pile of crap here. Um, one of the first people to speak so clearly on the p-value mess was a guy named Trafimow, and uh, T-R-A-F-I-M-O-W, and I believe that it was his, and it was actually in a journal of uh, sociology and experimental psychology, which was like, wow. Sadly, my bias against that kind of uh, academic efforts in science kept me from reading the original piece. But I knew that he had uh, written forcefully and critically of p-values and attributed that to replication. I didn't know how brilliantly he had written. But I also, in going back and reading his piece from, from uh, 2015, I think it was, I saw where the American Statistical Association felt compelled to finally say something. It's uh, America's oldest scientific organization. And in 2016, I think it was, they asked that we no longer use p-values for uh, confidence intervals in science work. Done. And he was the first of the big editors, Trafim, out to insist that they would no longer accept those. And then he, with a fellow named Briggs, uh, written a thing called the Replacement for Hypothesis Testing. And this was published in Structural Changes in their Econometric Modeling in uh, Springer Studies in Computational Intelligence. I brought that here in case someone asked for that. But uh, this is a brilliant offering. Um, and I, I have no doubt it works. I mean, I went looking for it, assuming someone had done it. And I found it, which is kind of an odd kind of bias in your, in your research. But uh, um, no one needs to worry, because it has no chance of being implemented. What it would do would s suggest throwing out the corpus of academic science and starting over. And the truth is, is that the over certainty that p-values provide us um, is, is a boon to academic science. You know, we're making scientists hand over fist and the student loans and, uh, man, it's, it's, it's ugly, James. I don't know, I don't know what to do. But uh, I do know that if, if uh, that this is the kind of solution that would be needed were academia open to the solution. And so this is one of these things kind of like uh, Hufi Ravenskov's work, where you won't find objections or criticisms of this. What the opposition has found it best to do is shh, don't bring that up. And that's where we're with that with that. But I'd love you to take a look at that. It's, it's in and of itself a brilliant work. What's the paper? It's, uh, it's got just a wonderful title here. It's a replacement for hypothesis testing. And it was published by Springer in their uh, publication, Structural Changes in Their Economic, uh, Econometric Modeling. But if you were to put in uh, Trafimo, T-R-A-F-I-M-O-W, and Briggs, and the replacement for hypothesis testing, you'll find it. And if that doesn't come up right now, I'll just give you mine, and I'll find another one. But it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful read, and the details in which he gets into um, what is wrong with null hypothesis uh, testing and where it's led us astray. He sums it up, it's a wee p and you cluck a cause. So you get that 0 .0, 0 0.05 and the, therefore it cause A causes B. And it's just, it's just absolutely not right. You will not get from there to there that way, not logically. Now here's what's interesting. There is, there is research that will replicate and is still false in that it doesn't imply what's assumed to be implying, even though you can do the experiment and get the same results. Where the error comes is in, in, in validation. And this is a point I might have made earlier. We talk about a demarcation between science and non-science. And I'm telling you, it's predictive value. So if you want to know astrology versus astronomy. And I actually watched my father in the 70s 
in front of an auditorium full of physicists, electrical engineers, um, advanced scientists all employed by Hughes Aircraft Company, asked them to differentiate astronomy and astrology. Or, you know, I asked them to, sh to give the demarcation for what it is that makes science, give a definition. And he was at the board for about a half hour, and in the end, he says, the, your definitions are beautiful. Explore the universe, learn new things, you know, all the, all the good things that you'd, you, we'd all hope would come of science. But he said, in the end, that none of these will differentiate astronomy from astrology. And so the essential demarcation is predictive value, okay? The example is given, if I have a cardboard box, and it's got, and it plugs into the wall, and got rabbit ears in an exhaust pipe. So this is like burning gas and plugged in and all this shit. And I kick it and it says 50 miles east of Barcelona in 75 days, three hours and two minutes, an earthquake of magnitude 6.5. And if that happens, what my moment says, the box is doing science. It's not electromancy, it's not the Ouija board, it's not rune casting, right? Now, I don't know how the technology isn't available to me, but I wouldn't expect to tear the box open and find a goblin or a mermaid or Harry Potter. If it indeed it works, we'd expect it to be working on first principles. He used that example because in his field, there was, and he was a rocket scientist, he built missile systems, and you never told anyone how your missile worked. None of your business. You didn't peer review it. You would delay patents as long as you could so no one else would take them. And there was a sad moment when you'd win the contract. What you'd have to do, if you got the contract second place, so they'd actually, what, fly drones by and you'd have to shoot at them with missiles. And it was pretty clear, your missile's good, mine's better, right? I get the contract. What happens is second place gets the production contract and a development contract, that person then has to share all their secrets with the other side. And he said, they have blown gigs before to hide a technology, so let's don't use our latest target identification device technology because we're not ready to give it up. We want to develop it in this other program. And so it was a very different thing than peer review. But in the end, it had no value if it didn't produce. It had to have predictive value. It had to have predictive value. There was something else this was getting me into that I said I should have mentioned, Emily. Ah, and there's another piece here. It's not just the demarcation between science and non-science, but we need to delineate between method and validation. And this is really, really important because the guys who have everything messed up, the scientism that they practice, they explain, they go in great detail about their methodology. And I gotta tell you something, there's no amount of method that creates valuable science. It may or it may not. It, the science is value at the moment of validation. And validation exists entirely independent of method. And so whether the, the theory comes from inspiration or perspiration, it still has its validity in its predictive value. And so if I dream equal mc squared, it's every bit as, as, as real. It has the same scientific validity dreaming it as opposed to deriving it. That didn't happen, but I could have picked some other example that could have been easily derived versus, versus just demonstrated. Questions? Sir. Where is, the, where is the focus on identifying the source or the agenda? I guess it was kind of a loaded question of, um, I guess, the, the motive behind the bad science. I guess, you know, we'll have different fields, obviously, nutrition, sports, uh, you know, fitness, but is, is there a, a specific direction being, like, toward either an individual or group behind the motive behind perpetrating the bad science? Well, you know, I keep explaining that, in fact, it was my crude observation is everything that's wrong is wrong on purpose. And then later for Russ Green and I was, We've only found corruption in the places we've looked. <laughs> you know, like anywhere we see it. And I remember things like tripping that I was a long, I was a charter subscriber. They, I, got a, I got a gift subscription years ago to Outside Magazine. And there were only two things I really knew anything about, and it was cycling and fitness, and they were always wrong on those. And so later I came to know Lindsay Yaw, who worked there. And she said, oh, no, we get everything wrong. Greg, the skiing, the climbing, it's all wrong. <laughs> like, 
the people that cycle get velo news, the people that ski get this, and it, outside is for people that have all the shit in their garage and don't do it, and the book goes on the coffee table. It really doesn't matter what we write. Uh, oh, okay, that helps, you know? Like, wow, and that's it. another one of these kind of wrong is wrong on purpose. Um, but when I told Jeff Kane this, I don't remember Jeff, he was a CrossFit CEO before Dave. Um, uh, it, <laughs> I said all that's wrong is wrong on purpose, and his, and his retort was, we don't have a healthcare system, we have a disease economy. And an outbreak of wellness could bring the whole thing crumbling down. Like, fuck, that's some, that's, that's some depressing thoughts, except it makes me smile and laugh. But it helps, because you know, I'd, I'd rather things be shitty than be fooled, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, I'll take the facts as they lie. I just want to know what's, what's really going on, and that is what's really going on. And so, whether it's an open border or, or cancer that doesn't cure, there's someone who's like, well, wait a minute, this is all good. I like it the way it is right now. And the amount of vested interest there is phenomenal, phenomenal. Brad, Brad Hirakawa, some of you may remember him, good friend of Rob Wolf and I way back. He was sitting in on a, he worked for a small pharma start, startup in San Diego, and he was awaiting a, 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 a conference call to start and the CEO of Pfizer, I believe it was, was talking about he'd gone on Atkins and his cholesterol plummeted, he's unhealthy, and, and Brad's listening as they don't know they're on, and they're just making this small talk around the room, and there's seemingly no realization that, like, wow, I mean, this is, this is a trillion dollars worth of medicine you're, you're unraveling right there in your own personal admi admission, you know? So it's a weird world. I'm not answering your question, but I think maybe I am in a world, I'm well aware of it, but what you need to do is just, I'll give you an example of what I said. I watched his Seattle dying, and I, when I, they finally got down to the numbers. Have you seen that? It was an ABC news piece, and like a, a, a rhetorical question, dying, it's dead, right? It was so bad. But what I found is that if you take the numbers that the, that the uh, people trying to remedy the problem claim, and you look at the amount that is mid spending on it, they're spending about $350,000 a head annually on the, on the homeless. And I was like, man, I could, you, could give, you could set someone up pretty good for 350 grand a year, right? And so I thought about it a minute, and I was like, I know what's going on. Someone's getting rich. So I asked Jeff to find out for me, like, where's the industry here? And there were three agencies, two in particular, siphoned off to tens of billions of dollars in administering to the homeless for medicine and outreach and transportation, big budgets, everything, all of it doing nothing except potentially exacerbating the problem. And maybe I'm getting political here, but I gotta tell you, it's really a sweet thing when you can get close to government and get funded heavily to address a problem when in fact what you're doing is making it worse. You can go back every year and see you need more. I mean, it is really a good gig and those gigs are hard to get and the people that get them do not let go of them and hold on with dear life and they end up with politicians in their pockets. And we just talk about Google. When we were in DC um, trying to navigate things, you know, I knew what it cost us to get the occupational licensure bill revoked in DC. And so when I found out that uh, 14 states in 23 occasions over 11 years had been lobbying with legislation to criminalize and restrict heavily what it is that you do, it, it didn't take the Podesta folks too long to come up with, that's a $130, $150 million effort. But the people lobbying these things, the ACSM and the NSCA, they don't have $10 million, not, much less $150 million. Where does that money come from? So what do you do? Well, you look to sponsors. And who are their sponsors? Well, it's Coke and Pepsi, gold and platinum sponsors. Would they help them? Well, if I don't know who else would. You know, do you know someone that would really thinks it'd be cool if, if we could silence trainers on the subject of, and that's what that was about. So you dig in and you look and you kind of learn the lay of the land and usually you can find out who's, who's benefiting from this, how it, how it works to their advantage. I, you know what, this is a, you're, you're asking about a system fix again, and I always come up short on system fixes. Um, I, like I, 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 I don't think we corrected fitness, but I think that we corrected fitness in the minds of each client that came through the door. 
And I don't know that revolutions aren't fomented one individual at a time and no one really ever had a plan for everybody but a plan for anybody. I don't know, and I, and I wish I did, and I recognize the importance of your question, and I feel short not being able to answer it, but I'll go back to fitness again. Um, I never thought for a minute that there weren't going to be fat people because of us. But I tell you what, man, you know, you, get, you give me a fat girl and I'll make her a thin girl. I know I can do that. And I could probably do it with enough enthusiasm and uh, 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 entertainment value that she would become a wonderful spokesman for the cause, and maybe that's what we need. But what I'm going to do is just start with trying to talk to anybody who will listen, increasingly refine the message. I think that we can put this out. Did anyone see uh, uh, No Safe Spaces with a Prager and Corolla? I highly recommend it. It's really neat because you're listening, you're listening for an hour having the, the importance of free speech explained to you. And here's the part that seems to be really a, a challenge for some younger people today, that that necessarily entails you hearing some things you don't want to hear. <laughs> that the importance of free speech will necessitate that, that, that everything you want to hear um, may be heard and some things you don't want to hear may also be heard and that's okay. We actually have to teach a new generation that. And I, 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 think, I think we're here. I think we're exactly there. The, we've got to, I've got to insulate some of us from the tyrannies of this shitty science. Being peer reviewed means nothing, nothing. We, ha we have to tell clinicians this. I don't care what the data says. What are you seeing in your practice? What I'm seeing in my practice, it doesn't work. Well, then that means it doesn't work. <laughs> Think how weird it was for me. I had, I had the Air Force send me 30 young men for pararescue training. They were about to go to Lackland. They were in Indoc just entering into the pipeline. They go off to Lackland and all 30 get through in a program with a 70% washout rate and the lead, lead kid, Josh Webster, who many of you may know, Josh Webster is the honor grad. In a program that washes out 70%, we had 30 kids 100% go through. I got called by an Air Force doc and he was really excited to work with me from Colorado Springs, from the academy. And what he'd like to do is validate my methods. What the fuck? What are we trying to do here? I think we're making war fighters, and they just, a whole bunch of them got through your program where you hadn't seen before. What's going to happen in the test tube? I was at a complete loss. I don't think that step's necessary here. Maybe for your own head, maybe there's some, something we do. We, God knows we sent games athletes up to Pepperdine to get poked and prodded and looked at and examined. I never heard if anything came of that, did you, Dave? Question. Please. What does a widespread predictive inductive model look like in medicine? Like, I get the hypothesis test that passes or fails or whatever, but like, what, what's the ideal state? I can't, I can't even begin to think about that without wondering what are the, what are the political chances of that happening? And man, I, I can't see it. Right now, I've got, I've got the best minds in medicine uh, kind of hanging low. I mean, like this crew at, 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 uh, at uh, Stanford is shocked at what they've been through. Um, Dr. Bhattacharya was explaining to me that uh, he, he thought that what they'd been doing was science all along. But what he's discovered is that he was conducting research that came to conclusions that the NIH wanted published. And so was I right or was I wrong or was I approved? Because I'm doing the same thing I was and now I'm a bad guy. And that, that's an amazing thing. What a hard thing to come to terms with. I wouldn't even venture a guess as how to, how to unfuck medicine. And, and, when I, and when I talk with physicians, um, it's, it's more on the level of them coming to terms with the lack of reliability in the structures that they've depended on for, for information. And I, I think we're still in that phase, you know? And so I would cast a skeptical uh, uh, ear and eye to everything and look for confirmation 
in a, in a clinical or empirical setting and make my decisions from there. How are you, kid? Good. I wish I had more answers. And the questions where I'm always at a loss too is, well, what do we do next? Oh, I got no idea. I really don't. I'm not, I'm not overly hopeful. But I don't think there's anyone here that couldn't orient themselves within this, this whole thing and come to a, some conclusions that look very much like what I've come to. For sure, for sure. And I also thought it was interesting, you know, I, Russ Green and I went into uh, uh, Senator Blumenthal's office and met with him and staff, and we said that, uh, that the um, PubMed abstracts, um, you have to cross the paywall before you get to see that the thing was paid for by Coca-Cola. And he goes, no. We go, yeah, we pulled it up. You know, look, here's what you see. Study showed that sugar is good for you. And you pay the money, and no one does, because they just, well, here's a study that says it's good for you. And then you pay the money, and you get on the other side, and you see, oh, you know, sponsored by the American Beverage Association. And it was just in one sitting there that he made a call to NIH and got that put onto the, that uh, disclosure put onto the abstract side. And, the, and within two days, we were seeing him. Look, it says over here that this was paid for by soda. You'd hope that makes a difference. I don't have a whole bag of those kinds of things. That one came as a surprise. I wish we'd gone into Blumenthal's office three years earlier and asked for this, but it often seems it's that way in the military too. There's someone that can pick up a phone call and make something happen. I'd leave it to you good people to be, to be that person, you know? But uh, I would like to get us past the point of thinking that uh, that uh, nine out of 10 dentists are right and one out of 10 is wrong, and that there's anyone that can get in front of you and say that if you don't believe in me, you're not following science, um, and you shouldn't be uh, following the warnings or the threats of any model that hasn't predicted something novel and important prior, right? And this, these might be harder lessons to learn, maybe they're more dramatic lessons, but I think uh, philosophically, and logically, they're pretty dramatic. I also want to leave you this. I've got it. We've, I've, we've, uh, what some of this is required is that we churn out a definition of modern science. And uh, uh, key to doing that was the understanding that science is an extension of language, lo logic, and mathematics. And so if science requires that 2 plus 2 be 4, or that a, a, a small p value is, is, uh, is evidence of ca a causal relationship rather than just a correlate to one potentially, or if terms get changed in their meaning, you have, we have uh, plasticity to terminology, where we've got a language fault here, like COVID in New York meant that you're a first responder that didn't come to work, and it meant somewhere else that they spun this PCR 60 cycles and found, and found the promised land. Um, so when we have fuzzy definitions, shitty math, um, or, or logical problems, how about this? I, we've, I know of several studies where the problem in the causal relationship is that the causal factor seems to be lagging, um, <laughs> lagging, lagging the effect. And so you want to say, if it's going to be a cause, it needs to happen first, right? And you have a right when you find problems in language, logic, or math to say that the science is no good and I'm not going to pay attention to it. And that's pretty liberating. It's amazing how often you'll find that that's exactly the case. It's hard, this is all hard to do. Is there an example of good science? Yeah, lots of them. Lots of them. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you one. Um, the people that used uh, uh, Bayesian methods and, and uh, supercomputers to finally resolve that the pig gets the swine flu, it evolves through the pig, goes to the chickens or ducks, takes a form that is deadly to man and is passed to us. We were never going to figure that out with, without computers and AI. It was, it was an amazing thing when it happened. But in the areas of advanced genomics, what's being done with computers and induction right now, and it's, it's brilliant. These are the same people that are getting uh, uh, computers to read MRIs 
and to take uh, out of focus photographs and put them in focus. How's that for a, for a party trick? No, there's a, there's a lot of good science going on, but it does tend to sit around industry and technology. And I, I wish this weren't true, but um, Google isn't confused by much of this. Even where they're probably complicit on the bad science, they're, they're super smart on the, on the side of, of inductive inference, inductive probability, and what's working. I know that because they've hired all the guys we like. <laughs> like Jake Vanderplus, whose videos I would look at. There's a guy who has a keen understanding. Without being political, I would look him up, Jake Vanderplus, and look at him on Bayesian versus frequentist methods. You can get into a lot of this by just looking up the Bayesian frequentist debate. You can also get to it looking up science wars and meaning of probability. These all lead you to the same schism that I'm addressing here. That's right. We have treated as sacred. Yep. And then when we, when we say, or when people say, follow the science, what they're really saying is shut up. They are. Rather than let's, let's follow science. Yeah, we need, we need to, to get away from the high priestess, high priest notion where you come down and tithe at the altar and everyone else shuts up. And you're exactly right. And I think, I think I'm on that very subject. That who do you have to be to say, I think the emperor's naked? And that involves, you, you know, you've got a cause that, that comes after the effect. Um, your math requires that 2 plus 2 be 5. You know, I mean, it just uh, anything that doesn't fly in the face of logic, language, or mathematics, science has to be an extension of that. It's a problem. We've seen a fascinating phenomenon. I'll give you one of them that's, that's you ever heard this theory of an alternative universe? Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. Every time we look at the electron, by whatever method, every time you peek, it's, a, it's random as to which way it may be spinning. And so it's going clockwise, no counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counter, and roughly 50-50. And, and it's led some people in that quandary, what if it's doing both? Well, let me tell you something, it's not doing both. The problem is how we're looking at it. And we need to find newer, better methods to examine a thing because it's not doing both, but what this led to is that there are two universes. There's one where it is spinning that way and one where it isn't, and we live in both of them, and you'll never know, and oh, it's just nuts. It's the wrong way to go. And particle physics has been doing this for a long time now, and I highly recommend a book by Selena, Sabrina, Hassenfeld. Anyways, the book is Lost in Math, and this is a particle physicist working with CERN and at the Frankfurt uh, in Germany at their big uh, particle research center. She's a, she's, a, uh, uh, she's a big name in particle physics and she says that particle physics is lost and that it has lost its epistemic grounding, that it is attempting to change the standards of scientific method to make it non-empirical, that criteria of beauty and symmetry have led us astray, that there hasn't been a significant discovery since 1973. We've got a whole generation of particle physicists who don't know why they're in the field. And she says that the cern halden Collider has been a colossal waste of money and disappointed everyone involved. Fascinating read. I, that, was, I, that was sent to me by way of Amazon's AI they know I'm the guy looking at broken science and would like this book, and indeed I did. And she mentions Popper and falsification in there, which was fascinating too. The physicists have long known that that wasn't getting them where they needed to go. This is a fascinating problem. I do think it's, a, it, it, I do think it's one, of the, one of the greatest problems in the world today. Please.
I don't know. This might just, this probably isn't a good answer to your question, but I'm going to share because it it's within that vein and it came up just the other day. Um, in working with our special needs people that we had in the basement of, uh, of uh, Santa Cruz at HQ, we had the morbidly obese and the elderly that we were putting time with. I came to see that what they were in desperate need is, is three periods of activity daily and that to open up the can of whoop ass once a day on someone like that for a level that was consistent with their capacity so that they would psychologically want to and physiologically be able to was diminished enough of a stimulus that it wasn't adequate to their needs. And so what I really wanted with these people is for them to do something active in the morning, something active, a, a session in the afternoon and something in the evening. And I realized that this is kind of a unification theory because that's kind of where the games athletes are too, right? You know, three a days. And uh, uh, that's very interesting to me. And then I came to see that the uh, one workout a day might be an artifact of the business we're in and what we do and that people come to see me. And uh, I didn't want to go publicly with that, really. I mean, it came up because it came up. And I think it's kind of along those lines. But uh, if, I had a, if I had a box again, and I've got a single client right now. I, had a, I have a guy that was uh, uh, struggling with a long running uh, chronic illness. And I found out from his wife that he's, and he's, he's, a, he's a specimen of a man. He's a great human being. He's a great dad. And he's deathly ill and shouldn't be. And uh, I found out he's drinking three six packs of Coca-Cola a day. And so I go, oh, I got, this is mine. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get to work. And I actually had to pretend to want to train him. And I do, I did, I am. But because I want to be there enough time to tell him, you got to get off the fucking Coke, man, and, so you don't waste my time. But uh, I'm also thinking of other things I'd like him to do for a second and a third effort. And that's, that's, that's interesting to me. No, there's not a lot that. Uh, you know, this had been in a long dormancy, and then I had the wonderful, wonderful experience of developing it through workout of the day with you. You know, and I and believe me, there were some wads that went up. That there was, there was one in particular that I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't undo it. And and uh, you learn these things. I, we got out on a, a 400 meter track, and it was, uh, it was 10 lunges, 15 by 95 push press. And we were out there like three hours. I mean, no one was going to finish. And I couldn't. I had Josh Everett and Greg Amundsen. And I couldn't make them stop because they weren't going to stop. And I thought they were going to die. And, <laughs> and it was just wrong, wrong, wrong. And it had posted and sounded good, you know? But you really learn the value of, of, of empirically testing things. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of people have, uh, have been the guinea pig. James. Yeah, that's, I, I don't think you have any choice. You know, I was telling, I told the physicians at the, at the MDL1 that, that uh, the onus is yours to make the, what, you, what you're taught, what you hear, what's practiced, it's got to comport with the clinical realities. That, the, that first and foremost, to be scientific, you have to be empirical. And to unsee things so the theory, theory fits is to make a, a mistake and probably in the end a dangerous one. So yeah, I think that's exactly what I'm saying. I, f I truly meant it when I said I can free any man from the tyranny of bad science. I said shitty science, and it's shitty scientists. And I, and I really believe that can be done. And, I, it, and part of what happens is that, and we've seen this in the people that have worked with us on, on CrossFit Health, with the let's start with the truth idea. By the way, I've taken that let's start with the truth. It's, let's, let's get back to that. Um, I think, in fact, you can get someone where they are skeptical of what they're hearing. And it might cause you to sit there with your doctor and say, based on what? 
And then you might get the study and go, you realize this is an epidemiological study. The data isn't really data and that it isn't, it isn't, it isn't, it wasn't a measurement derived from an observation, but it's a very subjective thing and it's someone's memory on a study and that this isn't, this isn't how science is done. You, when you're doing surveys, you're not doing science, doc. What else you got? I mean, it's okay to go there. And she might go, wow, I didn't ever knew that. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, a, I think that's fair to do. I think, you, I, think I, I, I give you that authority. I want to read with, to you just something we'd put together on, on uh, modern medicine. It's kind of, I call it a narrative outline. Um, it's, uh, this is not strong expository prose. These, the, sentence, the, the, the flow isn't there. But what was intended here is that these be the salient facts, each given a number line, given a, 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 a reference number, and then expanded in significant detail to create the curriculum. But I think you'll see where this is going. Modern science is source and repository of man's objective knowledge. That'd be one, right? Go on for hours about it. Science knowledge is siloed in models. A model maps a fact to a future unrealized fact as a prediction. A fact is a measurement. A measurement is an observation tied to a scale with an expressed error. An observation is a registration on the real world or on our senses or sensing equipment. It's a registration of the real world on our senses or sensing equipment. A model's validation derives entirely from its predictive power. There are four grades of model ranked by predictive strength and they are conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. A conjecture is an incomplete model or analogy to another domain. A hypothesis is a model based on all data in its specified domain with no counterexamples and incorporating a novel prediction yet to be validated by facts. A theory is a hypothesis with at least one non-trivial datum. A law is a theory that has received validation in all possible ramifications into known levels of accuracy. That last one, me and some of my science and math buddies are ironing out. Um, predictive power is evidence of and reason for science's objectivity. The sole source of science is reliability and the demarcation between science and pseudoscience. Predictive power is determinant of a scientific model's validity, provides the basis for any rational trust of science. Models are predictions mapping a fact to an unrealized fact where the current fact constitute the premises and the unrealized fact the conclusion of an inductive argument. Induction derives conclusions from premises with probability and not certainty. All scientific knowledge is therefore the fruit of induction validated by predictive power which is a measure of probability. It is important to note that validation comes independent of method. Models derived from inspiration or perspiration, both ranked by predictive power alone. It also warrants mentioning that, models, that modern science is an extension of logic and therefore must be consistent with the rules of logic, language, and mathematics. I think we covered a lot of that. But that can be driven home over and over and over again. And I mentioned no safe spaces because what I really liked about that is that it, it explains a very f elegant and important philosophical concept, important to our, 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 our very culture, history, constitution, and way of life, and yet does so in a way that I, could, I would have my mother or my children look at it, and, it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not overly simplified to the point of being insulting, and yet, carries the essence of something simple enough that everyone should know it. And that's, that's what we're going to strive for here. And so I think that if we can teach our children what science is and isn't, just maybe we could teach their teachers and maybe journalists and maybe even some scientists. That would be the hope. We will find success with this. I just don't know how much. I also don't care so much. I didn't need there wasn't, I was never a point where I'm like, this is all worth it if I get a thousand CrossFitters or not worth it with a thousand and is with 200,000. I was never, I've never really, I, I used to tell people I'm, I'm oddly driven, not so much by goals as I am by process. And so I'm just gonna keep doing this fucking thing and nobody can stop me and let's see what happens. I've usually generated better numbers out of that than I might have predicted if I were to try and look into a crystal ball and see how many people can you get to pull their head out of their ass and wipe their eyes clear. I don't know what that number is. And truthfully, I didn't do it, you did it, you know? But I, I do know this, if you, if, you, if you make sense and you gear your, your, your thoughts to the smartest person in the room, smartest people in the room, um, when they catch on, they're usually 
they're usually remarkably effective, even maybe more effective than I am at, at, at uh, distribution of the message. So that's the, that's the underlying thought. That would be the, if I had a hope attached to it, it would look like that. You know, my client base came that way. There was no, there was, I wasn't putting flyers under windshield wipers at the mall, right? Wasn't doing advertising. I did a good enough job with you that you couldn't stop talking about it. And so I'd finally meet your friends. They'd go, he's driving me nuts. I'm, you're kidding me. <laughs> good. People go, how do I talk my dad into this? I just nag him until he insists you shut the fuck up. The very thing I wouldn't do. You see, Dave and I get in an elevator. We've had this happen. Someone go, what's cross? We all look at each other and like, shit. I quit answering that. I think I did affiliate gathering. I explained this is in, uh, in uh, Miami. I said, when someone asks me what CrossFit is, I ask them, well, let's see, what's today? Today's Friday? What are you doing Monday morning at 10 o'clock? I mean, I so don't want to tell you, I want to show you. And what happens if you'll allow me to show you, what will happen is within a month or two, you're going to come back telling me. And you'll be a better teller of it than I was or could have been. There's some things you just, you're not going to describe CrossFit or chocolate or sex or a good movie. You just, you just got to have the experience and then you become the expert. It, it may be just like that with this too, where the light comes on. I know we've seen it within our circle of friends, and, but you should see how sick everyone is in my house of hearing about broken science. <laughs> One last question. It's, it's a great idea, and you're perfectly correct. And in fact, it's in the plans. And what we're doing is working on a, a broken science.org uh, uh, sandbox website. And amongst the things that would be on it would be the greatest hits of scientific misconduct. I mean, there are some doozies. I just, incredible gall, like the guy that painted on the mice to match the patterns of the mice that died that he saved with his treatments. and. You know, I mean, can you imagine with your PhD MD and a brush out at night painting on white mice trying to hold them still to get this study published? I can't even conceive of that. Guys, the only person that's gone to jail for scientific misconduct, and there's fallacies. It's just great. Um, I learned through this. I, I, would, I would suggest that anyone, that if you really got a penchant for this kind of stuff, and here again, I'm just kind of outlining my path. My father recommended Dave's stove to me. And it took me five hard years to get through his work. And when I was done, I, I, was, I was perfectly convinced. And I, I read his books in reverse chronological order. I should have started from his first book and gone to the last. But I didn't know until I went backwards and finally got to his first book. And it almost didn't need to write the others. It was so good. And that was in 1971. And I was so personally convinced that, that, that uh, induction science had its, its grounding in induction that induction has its grounding in probability theory. I'm convinced of that. And I said, but I, but I need more. And so I said, if David Stove is right, and I'm certain he is, I should be able to flip over to the math side of the world, get into the probability theory space, and find someone who's found induction in David Stove and the grounding of science. And so I went to Google Scholar. And you know when you found a graduate text in probability theory when you see the $250 price tag, right? Ah, that must be a popular text. And uh, I got all of the uh, textbooks in uh, uh, graduate uh, probability theory. One of them was entitled Probability Theory, the Logic of Science. And I'm like, wow. That just sounds too much like what I'm looking for. And it was exactly. And he had found stove, and he was grounding. And, and even more interestingly, he was calling together in 2003, he died in 98, but he had in his manuscript by 98, he was talking about all the things I'm talking to you about in, um, in Laplace, who I have since doing this work, I, I hold him in higher esteem than Newton or Einstein for the simple reason that he was so misunderstood for so long, and at 22 years of age, 
where he'd already invented uh, partial differential equations, he'd already uh, refined Newton's work, but he took a summer to explain to us um, in a series of essays how it is he was using probability theory to develop his unprecedented insight into astronomical reality. And that was through probability theory. And he said that he was using probability theory to correct defects in his knowledge. And people looked at that for almost 250 years wondering, what the fuck is he talking about? And we now know that he was not just right, but brilliantly prescient. There were some people that followed in that path and made no stink of it, like Jeffries, who has written more on geophysics than everyone else combined, Sir Harold Jeffries, and a fellow named E.T. Cox, a physicist, developed a whole probability of, of, of uh, an algebra of uh, logic. He applied uh, Boolean algebra to simple probability theory and produced some, some, some incredible work. Uh, uh, the people that have come out of that tradition through Stove, through Jaynes, it's really, it's really rich. And I would suggest anyone take a, take a look at that to the extent that you're interested. But when I found Jaynes, um, I knew that I was going to do this for the, for the rest of my days, that this is really neat stuff. And there's something so wonderfully, profoundly wrong in the, in the global view of science at, uh, it explains why there had to be a CrossFit and how it is that you're still addressing things that physicians that are looking at the peer-reviewed literature aren't understanding how you're able to do that. You know, I, at one point I saw that by polling, I knew there were 20,000 CrossFitting physicians in the United States. I estimated that many abroad. And what that means is here you are, you're a doctor that has to know something about sport, about fitness, about nutrition, that is at odds with what you've been taught. And it's very likely that you've learned more from the people in your gym than you've been able to impart medically to the people in your gym. And to get those people forward and hear them and feel that and see that, it's really interesting. But you're in a, you're in a, remar a position of remarkable influence. You've all seen it, right? Show of hands. Yeah. Rhonda Rocket tells a great story of being so sure that, uh, that uh, Ben didn't know what he was talking about on nutrition. And uh, a few months later, she's, wow, I'm the one that doesn't know anything about nutrition. That's good work. Thank you. I'll see you around. You're dismissed. <laughs> if you got any questions for me, come on up, talk yeah, to me.